November 24th, 1971. Portland International Airport. A man named Dan Cooper boards Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 to Seattle. The flight crew and the passengers describe him as an unremarkable guy. He's a Caucasian male. He's got on a dark suit, black tie, carrying a briefcase. He's one of the last to board the plane, sits in the last row in 18E. He orders a bourbon and soda and dons a pair of sunglasses. The plane takes off at 2.50 PM. The flight from Portland to Seattle is a milk run flown several times a day. It's about an hour in the air. This time around, the plane's carrying 36 passengers and six crew members. Everything's going to plan. Everything's on schedule. Until the man seated in the last row, Cooper, hands a note to the flight attendant, Florence Schaffner. She doesn't read it at first. She puts it in her pocket. And then Cooper says to her, you might want to read that. The note says, I have a bomb, and I'd like you to sit next to me. Florence Schaffner understandably sort of loses it, but she does comply and follows his instructions. Cooper opens his briefcase, revealing a makeshift bomb. Schaffner describes the contents of the briefcase as something that looks like eight sticks of dynamite, a battery, and a bunch of wires. Cooper has her attention. She knows he's serious. He demands four parachutes and a ransom of $200,000 when the plane lands in Seattle. Schaffner relays the hijacker's commands to Captain William Scott. But since it's such a short flight, ground forces need more time to react. So air traffic control keeps the plane circling around for two hours until they can gather the money in the parachutes. Investigators write down the serial number of every bill and then bundle it up into a bank bag. The plane finally lands in Seattle at 5.46 PM. Captain Scott parks the plane away from the building. Cooper sends out a different flight attendant, Tina Mucklow, and she goes out and interacts with the authorities. There, she collects the money and the parachutes and returns to the plane. She also brings printed instructions on how to use the parachutes, but Cooper tells her he does not need them. Cooper agrees to let the passengers off the plane. Two flight attendants, Florence Schaffner and Alice Hancock, also ask to leave, and Cooper allows them to. But the ordeal isn't over for the rest of the crew. Cooper wants the 727 to take off again and start to head towards Mexico City. He's going to keep the four remaining crew members as hostages. The flight attendant, the flight engineer, the first officer, and the captain. For this second flight, Cooper makes more demands. Cooper wants the pilots to fly with the wing flaps in an unusual configuration, a downward position. Now that's how a plane normally takes off, but then they raise the flaps. You wouldn't fly long haul with the flaps down because it creates enormous drag and means it can't go very fast, something like 200 miles per hour. Cooper also asks that they keep the landing gear down and fly below 10,000 feet. He wants them to be going super slow and super low. The pilots tell Cooper it can't be done. They're afraid the plane might just fall out of the sky. But the hijacker is adamant that it will work, and they need to comply. At 7.40 PM, the plane takes off for Mexico City. But 20 minutes into the flight, Cooper does something completely unexpected. He lowers the plane's rear air stair. The 727 has a set of stairs that can be lowered out of the back of the airplane. The pilot gets a warning light when this happens. Once Cooper lowers the aft stairs around 8 PM, he puts on his parachute, grabs his $200,000, and jumps out. The hijacker is never seen again. At 11.02 PM, the pilot safely lands the plane in Reno. At this point, the flight crew has stayed in the cockpit, and they're not sure if Cooper is still in the plane or not. But when the FBI searches the plane, Cooper is definitely gone. Almost immediately, the story spreads like wildfire. E.B. Cooper bailed out of a Northwest Airlines jet going 200 miles an hour at about 10,000 feet. The best guess is he jumped almost exactly over Le Center, Washington. The FBI takes the lead on the case, with assistance from sheriffs and state troopers in Washington, Oregon, and Nevada. They have very little to go on. This guy has committed an incredibly well-planned crime. Authorities need to begin somewhere. They start with his name. They know he bought a ticket under the name Dan Cooper. The FBI doesn't really suspect that's his real name, but criminals often choose an alias that's very close to their real name. 
So they run this idea by the Portland police, and as luck would have it, they know of a petty criminal who goes by D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper lives about an hour and a half from Portland in the Dolls, Oregon. And he's got a minor record, so police have him in the system. It's a long shot, but they know they have to start somewhere. And they're hopeful they can nab him on his way home with $200,000 of stolen money. A police officer drives to D.B. Cooper's house the night of the hijacking, planning to stake it out until Cooper comes home and catch him red-handed. But as soon as the officer arrives, he sees Cooper's already home. It seems unreasonable that D.B. Cooper would have committed the skyjacking, jumped out of the plane, and made it back home to his house in the Dells that night. The timeline doesn't fit in any way, shape, or form. So despite having a similar name and a criminal record, D.B. Cooper is quickly ruled out as the hijacker. Meanwhile, at Reno Airport, authorities race to gather evidence on the plane. Inside the plane, FBI agents find 66 latent fingerprints, but can't identify any of them. They also find Cooper's black clip-on tie and tie clip, some cigarette butts, and two of the four parachutes. That's it. That's all they have. In 1971, we don't have fingerprint databases like we do today. We also don't have DNA at this time. The tie clip and the tie are pretty unremarkable, so they're going to be hard to trace. There's nothing on the plane that immediately tells us who the hijacker is. With little to go on, a large-scale manhunt begins. The FBI knows that he jumped out of the plane somewhere between Seattle and Reno, and now they need to know where to look. But it's hard to determine Cooper's landing zone because they don't know exactly when and where he jumped. There are so many variables involved. What was the wind speed? When did he pull the ripcord? When and where was the plane exactly when he jumped? It's next to impossible to establish an accurate search area, but they start with a massive section of really thick forest north of Portland. This is a huge deal. The Air Force actually loans them an SR-71 Blackbird to help them photograph the entire flight area in hopes of developing a clue. Though the Blackbird retraces the hijacked plane's flight path five times, their search turns up empty. The Oregon National Guard brings out helicopters to search for Cooper. They find some plastic and broken tree limbs, but it turns out it has nothing to do with the crime. And then 200 US Army soldiers search the forest on foot. There's also a private salvage company that searched Lake Merwin with a submarine looking for evidence of Cooper at the bottom of the lake. They don't find anything. Despite all this effort, no trace of Cooper is found. People don't just disappear. He has to be somewhere. The FBI wants to get his face out to the public, hoping someone has seen him. With no actual photo to go on, the FBI enlists the help of a sketch artist. They talk to people who were at the Portland airport, who saw him buy his ticket, and people who were on the airplane. Both sets of witnesses give a near identical description of the man. He's a Caucasian man in his mid-40s with a somewhat dark olive complexion. He has a receding hairline, short dark hair, and is wearing a dark suit and sunglasses. This sketch, which has become world famous, comes out about a week after the hijacking on November 28th, 1971. It generates hundreds, if not thousands, of tips. You have to understand, D.B. Cooper almost becomes a legend. There's kind of a Cooper mania surrounding him. He's kind of like a Jesse James or a Billy the Kid, this kind of common man who beats the system. And in the 1970s, that's the coolest thing you can do. Claiming to be D.B. Cooper, especially in the Pacific Northwest, is just a way to get your 15 minutes of fame. This is a nightmare to these poor investigators because they have to sift through all these false confessions. After a few years, many agents speculate that they will never really find the real Cooper. The unsolved case continues to captivate the public five decades after the skyjacking took place. Perhaps someday, one of the many passionate sleuths still investigating this mystery will help us discover D.B. Cooper's real name.